Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Hannah Joy Lehman. Thank you so much for joining me at my first technical talk, which is automating the minutia with serverless and GitLab CI. So let me tell you what I'm going to talk about today. First, I'll give you a little introduction as to who I am, tell you what this talk is really about, what problem I was trying to solve, and how did I go about doing that? First, a little bit about myself. Um, so I have a couple of things I'm really passionate about, but in particular, I love to rock climb. I absolutely am obsessed with my dog, Izzy, and our new dog, uh, Kevin and I love to garden and grow my own food. I also started and run the Triangle Adult Junior Developers Meetup. We're a meetup that is dedicated to helping people who have entered technology through non-traditional means have the support and resources they need. And this month, because we're celebrating our three-year anniversary, we'll actually be doing our first national meetup. And lastly, I'm a site reliability engineer at Teamworks. Um, I've been there for a little bit over a year, started there as a back-end engineer, and I recently helped launch our LGBTQ employee resource group. So shout out to all of my fellow queer software engineers. So what is this talk really about? When I came up with this title, I was really excited about, you know, automating the minutia and thought about pulling up some dictionary definitions. And then I thought, no, that's been done before. So what is this talk really about? Well, this talk is about taking a really large to-do list and putting it in the cloud so that I can let my code do that to-do list for me. What problem was I trying to solve though? Let me tell you a little story. So when I was hired at Teamworks in September of 2019, I was hired as a back-end engineer. A couple of months into the job, my coworker came to me and said, hey, Hannah, I'm actually moving. And at the time, this was not, this was not COVID time, so most people were in the office. He said, I'm moving, and I was wondering if you'd like to take over my duties as our release manager. Well, me being eager and wanting to learn said, sure, no problem. I'll take on that task. Well, I didn't really know what I was getting into. So let me tell you a little bit about what I learned. Teamworks is a startup, which means that we have some goals and where we want to be, but a lot of our infrastructure and a lot of how we do things was really um, tedious and just um, not where we wanted to be. So this diagram shows our three environments that are represented by the horizontal lines. And each week we had to do a lot of tasks to promote code from one development branch to a master branch, which is used for testing, and then finally to our production ready branch. In particular, um, the release testing was done by our entire QA team over the course of a week, which this blue block represents. The release manager, which was the task I was asked to take on, had to be in charge of promoting the code, Oops, sorry, uh, promoting the code from our development branch to master, promoting it when it was ready from, uh, when testing was finished to our release web branch. And then SRE had the task of deploying it, of course. And that, those were just some initial things that I learned about the duties of the release manager. Well, a few, a couple more months later, I was asked to join our SRE team. And so my first project was to collect information on the release management duties and I went to my boss and I said, can I please automate this? This is tedious and it's taking up a lot of valuable time. Well, I quickly learned that there were also a lot of daily tasks. I had a daily Slack announcement that I had to send, which was, you know, par for the course. But this announcement came with a lot of information. First of all, um, thanks to COVID, I was getting in the habit of waking up way later than our offshore team that was up and working while it was 4 a.m. our time. So I had to solve getting that message sent way before I wanted to be out of bed. I also had to gather the versions of our web app and our mobile app, get the number of tickets that were remaining to be tested, get the number of regression test, uh, re 
regression cases that were left and then come up with any known issues, which were issues that if released into prod would introduce a bug. And doing that last bit involved monitoring a Slack channel on a regular basis, which was all day long, um, and asking about every bug that was posted to the channel as to whether it would block the release or not. So as you can imagine, this kind of built up and got annoying. Other tasks that were involved were closing the previous week's JIRA tickets, closing the JIRA release itself, creating a new version in JIRA, updating a version number.txt file, which was used by different parts of our code, um, creating our release cut, which was that part I showed in the diagram where the code was merged to master, updating swim lanes on our release testing JIRA board, back merging code from each environment just to make sure each environment had parity with the next, and announcing the approval of the release by QA once testing was done. And none of this involved the actual deploy to production itself. So I came up with some goals of how I wanted to automate and what I wanted to automate of these tasks. So ultimately, our goal at Teamworks is to reach a state of true CI CD. And I know that that is what everyone says, but we really were on a path forward towards getting our pipelines to build and release code at a regular cadence that it was merged into, into our production ready branch. So, but I wanted to focus on three things in particular. Um, I wanted to focus on the daily Slack announcement, wanted to cut out the JIRA operations that I was doing manually every Monday, and I wanted to automate the cut of the release from develop into our master branch. All while keeping these three things in mind, wanted to maintain accuracy and timeliness, manage versioning without a text file, and require minimal maintenance. A little disclaimer here, um, in full disclosure, some of this is still a work in progress. But today, I'm gonna focus on showing you how I automated the daily Slack announcement and the JIRA operations and how I'm looking to go about automating the release cut. How did I do this? So first, I wanted to make sure I use tools that I already know. Um, this included the Slack API, Bash and Python scripting, which I knew a little bit of each, Node.js, which I had the most experience with, but wasn't up to par with the latest version of ES um, or Node, and the JIRA API. And some tools I didn't know. TestRail, which was a product used by our testing team to define test regressions. GitLab, which we were just beginning to use to develop a, a working pipeline for our code. And then these other two tools that my boss kept mentioning, Amazon Lambda and Serverless, each of which I knew nothing about. So as I mentioned, I started with the Slack announcement. The Slack announcement is this message that I showed you earlier. And it clued me into some APIs that I'd be able to use. And as I mentioned a second ago, I had experience using the JIRA API. So I would use this API to get the app version, to get the number of tickets that were uh, remaining to be tested, and any known issues at the time. I would use the test rail API to gather any regression cases that remain. I would also use the Slack API. Um, Slack uses a post that you make to their webhooks URL via a body which contains a message, which was really simple for me. I knew that that Slack message all boiled down to this single post with a message that I make to the Slack webhook URL. And I used the node request library, which there are many versions of, but it was something I had experience with that would just allow me to very simply and easily make API calls to these various APIs. And lastly, I really wanted to keep in mind the single responsibility principle. It was really important for me to keep my code super organized so that I could always go back and fix it or make adjustments easily. So the bottom right shows how each of the APIs that I used 
con was contained within its own module in JavaScript um, that allowed me to keep things separate. But with more single responsibility principle came more questions. As I mentioned a minute ago, I knew that I would have to build a message to send to Slack. And that part was kind of already defined for me. And I was used to developing a node locally so that I could run the command node.js and then the location of the function to execute my code. What I didn't know was what server would I be hosting my code on? Would I have to handle any DNS resolution? Would I be, or how would I execute the function if I didn't know um, what the ser what server would be running it? And lastly, what the heck is AWS Lambda and what is serverless that my boss keeps talking about? So I did what I usually do when I'm not really sure how to go about something, and I just dove right into the code. So I'm about to, uh, I'm about to show you the code that I used to send that Slack message. If you recall, the first thing in the message was the version of the app. So here I have a method and a lot of these code screenshots, I've collapsed much of the logic just so I could fit it on the screen. But if you have any questions as I go along the way, by all means, reach out. Um, but this first method would take the Jira version's URL endpoint um, to the API and I have a separate wrapper function that builds the request so I could pass in which URL I was posting to and which method. And I then query the JIRA API through that um, request for the web version and the mobile version that I needed to build all of the other information off of. Next, I have a message called get message, which, or sorry, a, a method called get message. I now realize that that, uh, Function name is a little bit confusing because what I'm really doing in this function is I'm querying all of the APIs for those numerical values that I need for the Slack message. And both of these functions combined return to me all of the values mapped to a name in a hash essentially or a JavaScript object um, that give me the total number of, of um, tickets left for web, for mobile, whether mobile was skipped, um, the number of untested cases, which is regressions, and so on. So now what? I have some code and locally I'm able to run node.js index.html and I'm able to execute this function that returns me the values that I need. So from there, I compile all of the responses into a single message body. And this actually builds the string that forms the code um, that needs to be sent to the Slack API. And voila, I've got a message with my web version, my mobile version, and all of the numbers that I need for that message. But as I mentioned before, I still have questions. So uh, what server am I going to use? Will there be any DNS resolution? Um, how will I execute this? And again, what is Lambda and what is serverless? So at that point, I knew it was time to look into those last two questions because those were the ones that Boss kept pointing me to to say, this will handle everything you need. So first, AWS Lambda. What is Amazon Lambda? And I apologize if you can hear my dogs barking. <laughs> um, so. It, Amazon Lambda is really cool. Uh, it's basically something that lets you host and run code without worrying about infrastructure configuration, um, without having to worry about paying for runtime that you aren't using. And it just keeps everything really simple. So I started to dig into the uh, console and I see sure enough, AWS wants me to upload a single function. So that works great. That's what I was working with anyway. Awesome. But something stood out to me that was kind of strange. And that was, it wanted me to upload a zip file of my code. Well, I'm used to working in version control and I knew that this wouldn't be perfect from the get-go. So uploading my code every time I made a change just really felt cumbersome. 
I also had to start looking at permissions and roles in AWS, which is a whole map of um, security and um, allowing certain roles and permissions to do different things. And there were policies that I could attach to each role. And once I hit a list of 624 permission policies, I just kind of panicked. And at that point I said, you know what? Uh, well, let's just come back to Amazon Lambda because I'm not really sure what that's all about. And I moved on. <laughs> And I said, okay, well, what is serverless? And I should back up and say that when I was feeling frustrated with Lambda, I had already created two or three versions of the function in the console and just really wasn't figuring out all of the ways to connect it to get it working right. So I had given it the good old college try. So what is serverless? Well, once I found serverless um, and read into it, I realized this was really where I wanted to be. So serverless is a um, configuration utility that lets you spin up a cloud function from any provider, including Amazon Lambda, or you can use Google Cloud Functions. And it lets you very simply create your function and deploy it in the matter of a couple of commands. So how did this work? First, I went into the console of serverless and just created a test app, and this was just you know, named ATO sample for the sake of this talk. But once I created the name of the app, all I had to do was click deploy. With that, I was given two commands to run on the command line that would install the serverless package, init my serverless repository, and allow me to deploy that project immediately just from one or two commands on the command line. And what lastly stood out to me was Serverless offered this really convenient um, command line function, which is serverless invoke local, that would allow me to test my code from my machine without having to go and click any sort of um, deploy mechanism within the UI. Between serverless deploy and invoke local, I found exactly what I needed. So how did I set up serverless? Well, after I did a serverless deploy from my project that contained my Node app, um, I discovered that really serverless was doing all of the things in AWS that I needed it to. So I had, um, so all it entailed was a serverless YAML configuration that gave me just a few items I needed to specify. So I had to create the AWS role and specify a runtime and then pass in some environment variables and that was it. So you can see on the left that I had my code base and the only thing that serverless did is add a single YAML configuration file to allow me to deploy via serverless. I also learned that um, since I needed my function to deploy at 7 a.m., it was as simple as um, creating two cron schedules in the configuration so that my, my message could be sent before I was out of bed. And you can see from this really exciting graph on the lower right, straight out of serverless's console, sure enough, my function deployed at 7 a.m. and 3 p.m. on the day that I took that screenshot. And lastly, um, I mentioned that I had just to set up a couple of environment variables. Well, I was able to toggle those really simply um, to use the test channel that I had where I was just blowing it up while I made mistakes and learned what to fix. And then I could also switch that easily over and deploy the correct webhook URL um, straight from my YAML configuration. And with that, I was able to automate my daily Slack announcement without having to get out of bed before 7 a.m. So um, I'll just pause right there and go back and look at my goals. So we talked about um, the daily Slack announcement being the first goal. And I achieved that and that was great. So that was part one. So the rest of this discussion, I'll talk about the JIRA operations, um, a little bit about the release cut and how I went about those. Um, actually, I'll pause if there are any questions before I continue. Let's see. 
I see Q and A. I can't see the questions. Okay. And I can help you if you want to uh, pause yeah. questions. All right, so we got uh, two questions right here in the Q and A. Um, so how was the daily Slack announcement used by team members uh, to keep them in the loop? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the daily Slack announcement was used by two teams primarily. Um, for one, you know, I showed you that we have the weekly um, QA um, test, tests that need to be done. So that's part of our workflow. And a lot of our QA team was overseas. So even though they used the same platforms as we did, the daily Slack announcement gave them a really high level overview of how are we doing and how much do we have left to test this week. Um, it also helped the product team to see where we were at in case you know, they had any pressing um, urgencies that needed to be added to the deploy cycle before the end of the week. So for example, if we were really light on regressions and there were very few tests, um, very few tickets left showing in that announcement, um, then they might be able to prioritize some other work that we didn't think we'd be able to fit in. Great, yeah, uh, thank you for your question, Steve. And we also have uh, one from Daniel. Uh, just some clarification on what you meant by release cut. Yeah, um, so I will, let's see. Um, our release cut, so because we're not at a state of CICD yet, um, we are really using our three different environments to separate our work. Um, Teamworks is a startup, but it is about 10 years old. And we were only able to start um, writing a bulk of automated end-to-end -end tests uh, fairly recently. So for a really long time, we had an exclusively manual QA process. So the release cut was the process of merging everything that was in our develop branch, which is the working you know, branch that all the developers work off of, and getting that, uh, promoting that into our master branch or our staging environment, which is where QA would test everything that was written in code the week before. And that's just a good example of how, you know, we are a work in progress and, and moving towards more test automation and more um, automatic processes. Um, so the release cut specifically was the process of getting that code from develop into master. Great. Uh, we have uh, three more questions. Would you like to continue your presentation or maybe answer? Um, sure, I'll continue and then we'll have more time for questions at the end. Right. Sounds good. Great, thank you. Okay, so um, continuing. Um, so I mentioned the next goal was to really automate the JIRA steps. So one of the great things about when I joined the SRE team is that we had already started as a company to use GitLab, which was going to help us really move closer and closer towards CI, CD. Um, what I mean by that in this case was that we were already using build pipelines to run our tests upon merge. Um, and even you know, now today, uh, this wasn't happening at the time, but today we're using it to deploy our code into production. So there was already a path paved for me when I got to the stage of wanting to um, automate the JIRA steps. So this is just an image of what a pipeline looks like. So what I wanted to insert into that was here on the left, you see a release ops job. Um, one thing that was really important to me that I only recently was able to uh, find a solution for was that a failure in the release ops job should not do anything to block the remaining um, pipeline from being green. And that's because this was really uh, paperwork, so to speak, compared to um, deployment of in infrastructure. So thanks to GitLab, I was able to create um, a job that triggers a child pipeline. And you can see here, um, it says trigger, include, and it, and it defines this file where you'll find the rest of my um, pipeline defined. So what does that look like? Um, so I have my release ops job. It's a pre-stage to the rest of the pipeline. And 
at this point, I wanted it to kick off steps that updated the version, that closed the JIRA tickets, that create JIRA tickets, and that cut our release. And you can see here that even though this pipeline on the bottom has a failure at the end under cut release, the job that kicked off that pipeline called a child pipeline is green because it successfully triggered the child pipeline. So the awesome thing about GitLab is it's really as simple as defining some YAML configuration. Um, and so here I have my GitLab release ops.yaml. First, I define our stages. So I have four stages, which if I go to the previous slide are these bold um, words above the job itself. And the stages I have are semver, close tickets, create tickets, and cut release. And the great thing about GitLab or most um, pipelines is you can have as many jobs as you want per stage. The thing to note though, is that each job running in a stage is going to run in parallel. So because my um, scripts really kind of depended on one another, it was really important to me that each stage had its own function and that the next stage didn't continue until the previous stage did. So after I define my stages, I define four jobs. I have update version numbers, closed your release, create your release, and create release cut. And under each of those jobs, there's you know, a lot of information, but the most important part is that it's as simple as kicking off a script. So each job literally says, go run this bash script or go run this Python script. And I have one of those correlated to each of my jobs. And then underneath all of those, you see some rules where you define in what cases does this job actually run in the pipeline. So I mentioned before that I use bash and Python. Um, the reason for that was twofold. One, I really wanted to learn both of those languages more thoroughly. And two, I did this work a little bit disparately. So it wasn't like I sat down and just built this pipeline. Um, rather, it was I sat down and I built update version numbers. And then a few weeks later, after doing some other work, I had time to go in and automate the JIRA operations. So um, for that reason, I kind of bounced around between Bash and Python as I wished. So I'm going to just give you one example of each. Um, I don't want to walk you through too much code because I want to leave more time for questions. But um, first, we'll look here at Semver, at updating our version numbers. So this is, this is a bash script. And the pipeline literally just runs that script from its location and says minor, which is a function of how the Semver package in Node works. Or, um, yeah, because this is a global node package. So first, um, I get the latest prod release version. So I mentioned before how one of my goals was to get rid of using a version text file. Well, I just about two weeks ago was able to edit this code so that I was no longer getting the version from that file. We're now using git tags, which are super helpful. And I do a little bit of parsing to make sure I've got the latest tag and that I don't have any of the extra verbiage with it that I need. And you can see that here, I just trim the version and get rid of um, the words that are ahead of it because each version was named release web dash version. Next, I increment that version. So I create a new version. And if you know bash, dollar uh, sign one takes the argument that you passed in, which in this case would be minor. And I take the version and pass that to it as well and create the new version. I then create a new tag with that version and I push the tag to the repository. And that's all it took to create our update version um, GitLab job. The next example I want to show you is how I used GitLab and Python scripting to close the JIRA releases. And this is, um, the name of the job is a little misleading. I'm not just closing the release, but I'm also closing all of the tickets that are related to that version during that testing week. So again, I use Python and I use the JIRA API. I start off by getting the tags the Python way using a repo um, package. And I split that version similarly as I do in Bash so that I just have the version number. 
From there, I'm able to use the Python requests library, which works very similarly to the node requests library. And I do a simple get passing in the version number to JQL, which is the JIRA query language. Um, it's not ideal uh, to have to pass in this long um, URL encoded string, but for the purposes that I need of just getting these tickets, and making sure I'm only getting ones that are still in progress, it worked. Next, I build a payload which tells the JIRA API what to do a put on when I pass in the IDs of each of the issues that I've just retrieved via get. And then I iterate over that list of issues. And for each list in that issue, I do a post request that updates that issue to a transition ID of 251, which I had done a query for to find that that's the JIRA transition ID for done. Lastly, I get what JIRA calls a release or a version. Um, so before I was getting the actual version of the app, in this case, I'm getting the version that um, as it exists in JIRA because JIRA does have a releases um, object that you correlate to your tickets. So I get that version, or I, I'm sorry, I get all of the versions. And then I use this version is current release method to filter and find the current release in JIRA that correlates to the current version of the app. Lastly, I close um, that release and basically call it released. And that's it. That allows me to then have automated all of my JIRA um, methods of, that I was normally having to do manually and making it a simple GitLab job called closed JIRA releases. So how did we do? Um, I've created a GitLab pipeline. It does a lot of this work for me, updating the version, closing the JIRA releases, creating tickets. And it looks like I've gotten partway through my goal. You can see at the bottom right corner, the cut release job is red. And that's because it's still a work in progress. Um, you know, on one hand, automating is simple. And on the other, every week I find, wow, I made an assumption there. So um, wanted to just be honest about that here because not everything is always perfect. And lastly, my goal of requiring minimal maintenance. Um, that one kind of gives me a laugh because every week I'm making some sort of small tweak to my automation scripts and they've sort of become my little baby at Teamworks. So how did I go about doing this? Well, I took a giant list of to-do of to-do items and I used Amazon Lambda and serverless via GitLab um, to put them in the cloud. So with that, thank you so much. Um, I'm Hannah Joy Lehman. Um, here's all of my info. Please reach out if you have any questions. Um, if you're a junior developer, um, find us on meetup.com. And um, you know, thank you so much to All Things Open for having me. Awesome, great presentation, uh, Hannah. Uh, like uh, someone said in the chat, we love talks that have real world examples. <laughs> so yeah, super insightful. Um, we do have about 10 minutes to go through some questions. So we have five right here. If you have some more, uh, please use the Q&A uh, section, uh, the function in Zoom. So let's just get started. So why, why did you use serverless and not a cron job by an existing EC2 instance? Yeah, that's a great question. So at Teamworks, we historically use a lot of EC2 instances for everything. Um, but the thing about serverless compared to EC2 is that EC2 you pay for all the time. Um, and your, your code has to be, you know, living there, breathing all the time. But with serverless, um, which allows me to use Amazon Lambda, um, I specifically only pay for the compute time that is occurring when my code is executed at 7 a.m. and 3 p.m. Awesome. Um, uh, do you ever need to manage concurrent work that belongs in different releases? And how do you communicate that via this tool? Oh, that's a great question. Um, the answer is yes, I do have to manage concurrent work. Um, but 
with the goal of CD in mind, what, what I really focused on was our production environment. So I'm not using this tool to manage versions that are below production. Um, I'm only using it to manage um, the JIRA ops of the production version and the daily announcement relating to our staging environment. Um, I'm sure it could be um, extended to do more of that work, but um, I kind of got my work cut out for me when I joined and said, hey, let me automate all of this. Uh, awesome. Yeah, raising your hand. Yeah, someone we <laughs> on that offer. Um, so another question here, how do you uh, algorithmically approach a task like this, where it can quickly devolve into a half a dozen other tasks? That's a great question. Um, pardon my dog in the background. Um, well, algorithmically, I think with any task that you're trying to codify, um, it's a lot of commenting and a lot of taking notes. So when I was first asked to be release manager, um, I sat down with the previous person in that role and took copious amounts of notes. And then I started to look at things and say, okay, what is using an API that is available to me? Um, as I mentioned, I had experience using the JIRA API. So um, as much as there were times when I wanted to just say, okay, go do this in the code, I was really limited to what endpoints were available to me. And so it was a combination of what do I want to do and then what is available to me via the API that I'm trying to use. Um, a good example of that was the versions. So JIRA has the versions endpoint, which is not um, verb, you know, it's not tied into uh, versions in my app code base the same way, but I had to dig into the API like a lot before I could find that, oh, that's what I meant when it, or that's what it means when I look in JIRA and it says releases, it actually means versions. So a lot of it was limited based on what I, what tools I had available to me. Okay, the next question, oh, sorry. Oh, no, yeah, if you, if you please go ahead. Okay, um, I see, do you ever need to manage concurrent, oh, we answered that one, let's see. Was this work part of your regular job activities or something extra you did? Oh, that's a great question. Um, this was part of my regular job activities. And I have been so fortunate because uh, when I joined SRE at Teamworks, a lot of why I joined was out of, um, out of my control and based on the needs of the business, which just happens. Um, we needed to kind of shuffle engineers around and do different things, but I had no site reliability experience. I didn't know the darndest thing about um, servers and monitoring. And so to me, uh, it seemed like a good foray into that work. And fortunately, my boss was really on board. And I would say if you ever are asked to take something like this and do it at home, you know, if you're really passionate about it, go automate something you want to automate for your own life. Um, but if you're, if you're, higher ups are asking you to automate work from home, um, you know, some other things need to be taken into consideration there. Okay, the question next is, is your project public? I'd love to be able to dig into this more as a solution for issues I have. Um, it's not public, but I will um, talk to my boss about putting it on a public repo, because um, currently it's it's withheld uh, within our private Teamworks repo. But if there's any part of it that I can put on my private GitHub, um, I will. And if I do that, then I'll post it via LinkedIn um, so you can have access to it. OK, um, where are the GitLab pipelines actually running, serverless or an EC2 worker instance? Um, that's a great question as well. So the GitLab pipelines are running on what's called the GitLab runner. Um, and I believe those are uh, in Kubernetes, but we don't actually manage that. Um, there are configurations of GitLab that you can manage yourself, um, but ours are running through on the GitLab runner, which is um, running via Kubernetes, which is not um, serverless or EC2 necessarily. Um, we do have uh, EKS, which is 
uh, I believe it's Elastic Kubernetes service in AWS, which allows us to, um, you know, at least have an eye on the um, EKS instance that is running our GitLab runner. Since you mentioned you have Kubernetes, why not using it instead of serverless? Okay, that's a great question as well. So um, a lot of this work started back in um, January. And just for, I guess, context, we just started moving our services over to Kubernetes um, as early as maybe July, I wanna say. Um, so that's the main reason, you know, I would love to containerize this work and get it you know, just totally um, scaled and everything on its own through Kubernetes, but um, we're just not there yet. Awesome. So those are all the questions in the Q&A board. If anyone else has anything, by all means, post that there. But I see a bunch of comments in the chat. Let me see if there are questions hiding in there. Um, Let's see. Well, thank you for all the support, everyone. You guys are awesome. Um, miss all of y'all. <laughs> feel like I'm on a podcast. Um, let's see. There's got to be a question in here somewhere. All right. I do see a comment. Um, I'll mention a couple of these. Uh, if you're in AWS and Python trying to do serverless, then check out Amazon's Chalice. Um, I don't know why AWS doesn't publicize this more, but it makes everything super simple. Awesome. Think of it as serverless and Flask together where the application defines the stack. Cool. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, shout out to my Letterkenny GIF. I appreciate that. Let's see. Firebase Cloud Functions has a pretty cool version of this as well. If anyone is interested in AWS or Azure alternatives, totally agree. Um, I've also heard uh, Google Cloud Functions operate very similarly. Um, I used AWS because that's what I was initially pointed to, and that's what we already use um, as a company. Um, but there are definitely a lot of similar but different ways you can um, do this work. Cool. All right, three minutes left. I know someone has a question and don't forget you can ask anonymously if you'd like to. So no pressure there. All right, maybe while we wait, I can uh, kind of give my uh, kind of post presentation uh, spiel. But again, Hannah, thanks so much for this presentation and thank you all for the great engagement and questions. Um, if you enjoyed this presentation and others that you see today in this track, please keep in mind that the individual DevOps Days Raleigh event is coming to the McKinnon Center in Raleigh um, and we'll be back April 8th. I uh, definitely want to connect with Hannah with you on your meetup. Hope maybe we can get that involved somehow. Um, so finally, the next presentation in this room will be on teams with open source with Tracy Miranda. So thank you again for everyone for joining and thank you so much. Um, and per request, I am posting my Twitter and uh, LinkedIn right now as well. I think those can also be found on the uh, All Things Open website. Um, and my GitHub user is github.com slash Hannah Lehman. And um, the meetup is again, the Triangle Adult Junior Developers. Um, as I said, we're having our third anniversary this month. So would love some support um, throwing our first national meetup, which will be the second Wednesday of next month as well. Cool, there is one last question. What are you automating next? Well, hopefully next year, I won't have a red bubble next to release cut. Um, I really would like to get that figured out so that um, not only the release cut, which is the merge itself, but the deploy of that to our staging environment can be completely automated so that Monday mornings, our QA team can wake up and have that ready to go. Awesome. 
Thank you all so much. I really appreciate everyone showing up.